Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Considering a Lateral Move, moving to or from government and public interest, put on through the Charles Widger School of Law's Villanova Law Alumni Association Board. My name is Kim Madden. I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Relations for the Law School. We're excited to have you here today for this program. As a reminder, this is the second program in a four-part series. Each panel will discuss a different type of lateral move, and today we're talking about moving to and from government and public interest. This is an anonymous program today, but if you have a question, please submit it in the Q&A and I will direct it to our moderator. And now I'm excited to turn it over to our moderator today, Ashley Lina. Ashley is a partner at Montgomery McCracken and is a Villanova Law Alumni Association board member. Over to you, Ashley. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm going to just repeat something that Kim said because I wanna stress the importance of it. Today's meeting is anonymous. We cannot see you. We don't have access to your names. Any questions that you submit will be kept anonymous. And we want you all to know that your privacy is of the utmost importance to us. The purpose of today's conversation is to provide some alumni perspectives on moving to and from um, government and public interest positions. We've already received a number of questions from alumni who are interested in hearing about the journeys of our presenters today, our panelists. I'm gonna ask that our panelists introduce themselves and then I'll begin by asking um, each of them to go over their background and history and how they've made the transition. And I'll apologize in advance because I'm undoubtedly going to be interrupting each of you um, as you do that with questions from the audience and questions that I might have myself. The purpose of today's presentation, um, or at least our, our objective today, is to provide alumni with information and a safe space to talk about making moves to ask questions that they might you might not otherwise know who to ask or where to go to. And also to remind you all that we have a robust alumni network with diverse and interesting backgrounds and that we're here for you. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to start with my dear friend, April Bird. Um, April, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, sort of your journey and where how you got to where you are today. Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Ashley and Kim. I am so privileged to be here. I am a proud 1995 uh, alum, really happy to be here today. I am a partner at Eckert Siemens in Philadelphia in the products liability and mass tort litigation practice. And I have made a number of lateral moves throughout my 26 year career, both within uh, government and from government to private practice and back. So I'm really happy to share those experiences a little bit and answering any questions. Uh, when I graduated, I was keenly interested in getting as much litigation experience. I went to law school to try cases. <laughs> That's what I thought. I wanted to be a lawyer since I was in ninth grade civics class. And so when I was looking at places to go, I had been a summer associate at two large Philadelphia law firms and had the opportunity to go back as an associate. But I wanted to get litigation experience up close and personal and very early in my career. So I went to the Department of Justice, the US Department of Justice, right out of law school through their honors program, which is basically just the program through which you have to go if you're coming right out of law school instead of making a lateral move. And I went to DC and I was in the civil division in the torts branch because torts was my favorite class in law school. And all these many years later, I practice in mass torts. So you can see it's, it's stuck with me. Uh, and I was there for two years and it was a dream come true because I was able to provide a service to the people, to service to the government, but I got an incredible amount of hands-on litigation experience, uh, depo deposition experience, hearing experience, all the things that junior associates, mid-level associates, and some partners at law firms dream about for many, many years before getting. Uh, my first assignment was when the head of the division came to me and said, oh, great, you're new, nice to meet you. Here's a $5 million complaint against the United States. It's in the Southern District of Texas, bye. Uh, and I had to tap into my knowledge. Okay, wait a minute, civil procedure. I either have to file a motion to dismiss or I have to answer, at least I know that much and I was off to the races. Um, I spent two years, two fantastic years through which I made many connections, uh, both inside and outside of the government. And then I decided that I wanted to take a little bit of a detour and go back to one of the firms with which I had been a summer associate. So I went back to a large law firm in Philadelphia, again, bringing the experience I had gained 
from DOJ. Uh, it's all translatable. And that's something I really want to impart today. It doesn't matter where you practice. It matters the experience that you get, because whether it's trying a criminal case, trying a civil case, trying a tax case, doing an administrative hearing, taking testimony is taking testimony. You might have to learn a different subject matter, but learning those basic skills and wherever you learn them, that will take you throughout your career, no matter what you do within the area of law. And that was one of the real reasons I was so keen to go into the government to get those skills at the, at the basement so I could build upon those for the rest of my career. Um, I spent a couple of years at the large law firm and did uh, had a lot more exposure and um, responsibility given to me because of my background. But then I hadn't tried any cases. And like I said, I went to law school to try cases. And so I left the large law firm to go to the U.S. Attorney's Office. I was there in two different offices, and one in Delaware and one in D.C., where I learned to try cases. Um, that's what I did for about eight years, eight and a half years. I was a federal prosecutor. I tried about 35 first chair jury trials, federal and state court. In D.C., it was state court. In Delaware, it was federal court. And it was an incredible experience. But again, what I want to really impart, I was, I was a federal prosecutor. So clearly, there's really no crossover between what I did subject matter wise as a prosecutor it was great, multi-jurisdictional drug racketeering and murder conspiracy cases, and what I do now, which are products liability cases. But what I got to bring with me and what I got to develop was my trial bench and my trial skills. And I can tell you that that's what's on my resume. And when people call me, when clients call me, when I was looking to leave the government and looking around, the reason I was able to, to get offers and to really make that exp uh, the transition fluently was because of the marketable skills. And you can get that at the DA's office. You can get that at the public defender's office. You can get it in a clerkship. You can get it in many aspects of government service coming in one way or going out the other way. Um, I then, like I said, transitioned back into private practice and I've been in private practice now uh, for many years thereafter. And I get to try many cases building on my experience. So that's me in a nutshell. But because I've made a number of lateral moves, I'm really happy to answer questions. Um, and again, happy to be here. Thanks, Ashley. Love it. I'm going to toss the baton over to another dear friend, Diana Cortez, who I was lucky enough to know way back when, um, before she literally took over the city of Philadelphia. So Diana, if you could tell everybody about your background um, and the moves that you've made, please. Sure. Thanks so much, Ashley, for that warm welcome and for the inclusion in this great panel. Um, I want to piggyback off of what April said in that encouraging you all to really focus on those transferable skills, one of them being confidence, because I think if you see that you're, you know, when you go into different government um, opportunities, you see that you are given a lot of responsibility right away. And therefore, it is your opportunity to really build up those skills, including confidence, because I think one of the things you will definitely you may not win every single case, um, but you will definitely have that confidence in speaking to a judge and also in just dealing with people. Because one of the, I think, great um, transferable skills when you are a trial attorney is that you definitely have to be able to read the room, read what is it that motivates each different party that you are dealing with, and being able to see if there's a way to address those needs, whether it's through trial or some type of resolution. Um, so I think that's one of the things that I would, you know, definitely um, encourage you all to keep in mind. Also, when you are um, encouraging you all to definitely be present at whatever stage you are in your career, definitely taking advantage of all of the different opportunities that particular um, employment opportunity has for you. Because at times, I think, especially as lawyers, just the way it's set up, you're thinking about your second summer after the end of your first year, and then that sets you up for the rest of your career. So we're very, um, we're thinking a lot ahead, but at the same time, I really encourage you all to be present wherever you are and definitely take enough, um, take advantage of all of those different opportunities. Having said all that, I started off with um, Judge Sanchez, who is now the chief judge down at the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. I did a two-year clerkship with him. Um, I initially, when I started law school, I have to admit I had no interest in clerkships. My goal was to, similar to April, wanting to be a trial attorney. I have her beat a little bit. I was determined to be a trial attorney at the age of nine. 
Um, I wanted to specifically to be a prosecutor because that's what I saw on TV. And I thought that was fascinating. I liked the, I, I love the idea of going into court, arguing, fighting for justice and, you know, the American way and all those things. I didn't have any lawyers in my family to essentially tell me that's not all what lawyers do. That's a very small section of what they do. And even when you go to, you know, certain prosecutor's office, there's so much more there. I went with that vision to law school. And so I was really fixated on that. I still took the opportunity to take an externship with Judge Sanchez. Um, and that was just a really great opportunity. Just, you know, the way he was an immediate mentor to me, even as a law student. So if there are any law students listening, um, you should definitely take advantage of the opportunities that Villanova has for you right now, um, including externships. Um, and even if it's something you didn't think you would like, you never know what interests it might pique. Um, so in working with him that, uh, that fall, I, you know, it was just very interesting. I saw the value in it immediately to be a, in being a clerk, being behind the scenes, seeing firsthand lawyers present arguments, um, knowing exactly, seeing firsthand what is good lawyering, what is bad lawyering, and what is ugly lawyering, and never <laughs> wanting to be the bad or the ugly. Um, but also just getting that insight from a judge. And when you talk about a transferable skill, that has been one of my key transferable skills to say that I have this you know, perspective from at least this one judge and I can sort of analyze a situation from that. And that brings great value you know, wherever I have been. So fast forward to after my clerkship, I went to a large law firm here in Philadelphia um, focusing on white collar crime and commercial litigation. So again, any federal court cases um, that were in front of Judge Sanchez or others um, or some of his other colleagues, I would be asked if I had any insight on that and at times be asked to work on it. Um, I was there for, I was at this firm for about five years. I still had the bug or the itch to go be a prosecutor. So then I went to the DA's office, which is where I got to work with Ashley. Um, and I was there for two years trying, trying different uh, jury or bench trials, um, preliminary hearings. And it really was a great experience. It wasn't everything I had wanted and more, but I think that's also another lesson in that I don't think you should put any job or any position on a pedestal because I think one of the things you should, well, at least I've realized, I don't know if everyone else wants to do, but I think one of the things you should realize is that you yourself as a person change what your requirements, you know, to be a better person change. So just giving yourself that flexibility and realizing what you wanted earlier on in your life may not be what it is that you want or need, especially to develop as an attorney, as a person, and potentially as a leader. So I had those two great years at the DA's office. I then moved to another law firm in, um, in Philadelphia. And there I focused on civil rights defense. And it was there that I was able to um, work tangentially with my predecessor, Marcel, um, Marcel Pratt in the um, civil rights arena. We, this particular firm represented police officers as conflict counsel. And so there were different matters that we had to interact with. So when he was promoted to um, from chair of litigation to city solicitor, he had reached out to see if I was interested in taking over for him in that position. Um, and at first it was a, a surprise um, because I had also just come back from maternity leave. So I was being presented with this great opportunity, managing 70 different people, overseeing um, five, I don't know, six different areas of litigation. Um, and, but at the same time, trying to manage being now a mother, a caretaker, uh, and, you know, a then seven month old. Um, so I did what anyone else would do. I said, sure, let's give it a try. I then went on. Um, and I think that's another perhaps lesson or potential takeaway is to definitely engage and embrace these different um, opportunities, even if you feel like it's a little bit outside of your comfort zone, I think you got to remind yourself that they're being presented to you for a reason and definitely embrace it. So that was my second, yeah, second trip back to government. Um, and, and working as a chair of the litigation group, 
um, working on all different types of matters, which ranged from um, helping out with the uh, sanctuary cities. I think by the time I had arrived there, the sanctuary cities litigation had been resolved um, and just helping out with the elections, the election litigation from last year, um, which was uh, a, a great and significant thing. And just the day-to-day -day cases that we get. I think overall the city has about like at any one time, 3,000 complaints filed against the city. Uh, and then we are also trying to make sure that we are more active in filing lawsuits against different public entities and private entities, um, including right now we are involved in the opioid manufacturers and distribution lawsuit and just trying to negotiate that um, versus you know, continuing on and um, fighting that out in court. So from that, then I was um, presented with another opportunity to then be the city solicitor once that um, vacancy arrived. And so I've been at this position almost a year to the date. I think December 10th or December 11th is the one year anniversary. So it's been a different adventure every day. And I really think that this position is sort of a culmination of all the different, not just legal experiences I've had to date, but also in um, you know the people skills that I think a lot of times gets overlooked or are at times underrated um, by certain firms or certain organizations, but it is so critical to make sure that you are able to communicate effectively with people. And so that's sort of been, I think, another key takeaway throughout my back and forth in public and private government or private um, opportunities. Love it. Thank you, Diana. Um, I'll now toss it over to my newest friend, Simeon Poles, who um, is a, a a major contributor to the Villanova Laws alumni community, um, very active and ha also has an interesting story to share um, at a different point in his career. Simeon, tell us a little bit about you. Sure, uh, thanks Ashley. And I'm uh, pleased to be here to, to discuss this topic um, with everyone, because I think that it is um, you know, just very critical that you know uh, sort of what the landscape looks like and, and you know, how to take advantage of opportunities. Um, I am a 2017 graduate of the law school <clears throat> um, and currently uh, a, I guess now fifth year associate at uh, Dwayne Morris, um, where I practice in the area of commercial litigation. Um, my road to being a lawyer, um, you know, I also knew pretty early that I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, I guess it was, um, so it would be later than uh, Diana and, and April uh, by just a little bit. When I was in um, ninth grade, I, I started doing high school mock trial here in the city of Philadelphia. I uh, went to Masterman at that point um, and joined their mock trial team. And I thought, wow, this is, this is cool. Like, I, 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 I really enjoy this and I think I want to do this. Um, you did mock, mock trial all the way through high school. Um, and as is usually my disposition, um, decided to take the longer and slightly more circuitous route from the point of knowing that I wanted to be a lawyer to actually becoming a lawyer. Um, so, and, 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 you know, there was a lot of, of, uh, of, of, of sort of subtext to it, but uh, the long and short of it is I, I kind of, uh, if, if I could quote Drake for a second, started from the bottom and now I'm here, um, I started in a file room at a law firm, actually, actually at your law firm, uh, started, it, you know, in the file room. And then a few years later, after that, I became a paralegal. I was a paralegal at a, a personal injury firm for a number of years. Um, and I had a dear mentor who has uh, since passed on, um, but who I worked for, who literally dragged me into his office and said, um, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Did I mess something up? Did I like, you know, did something get misfiled? Did something get lost? And he says, no, what are you doing with you? And I'm like, I, okay, like, I'm not sure what that means, but I'm sure you'll explain it to me. And he says, he tells me to look around his office and I look around his office and it was very nice. And he says, don't you want this? And I said, uh, actually, yeah, I, I kind of would like that. And he says, well, then you have to stop hiding from your destiny and get out there and do it. And basically said, like, right now, I'm tired of hearing you say next year, next year, next year, next year, next year. This is the last next year you're going to apply right now. 
uh, and get the ball rolling. And so that's what I did because who's going to say no to this guy? He's, you know, my boss and my mentor and a very dear friend. Um, and so I applied to, to law school, um, got into Villanova, um, went to visit Villanova. And I had visited a bunch of schools. I'd gotten into a bunch of schools and I looked around and I said, this is home. This is where I need to be. Uh, so I joined uh, the class of 20, 2017 in 2014. Um, I also had a favorite class that sort of shaped the rest of, of things going forward. Um, I took uh, Professor Brogan's privacy seminar. And uh, as I was applying to law school, it sort of dovetailed as I was applying to law school, um, the target data breach, the, the first big one had either just happened or like just before, like right at the same time. Um, and 60 minutes ran like a hour long expose on data breach. Well, that data breach, data breaches generally, and then big data sort of more generally data brokers, all the stuff you don't know that's being collected about you. Um, you know, the privacy implications, how much data is out there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I had, you know, applications you know, in front of me. And I just sort of pushed everything to the side, watched this expose. And I said, I want to do that because that's, that's it. Um, and then I took Professor Brogan's privacy class that reinforced my desire to, to, to do that sort of thing. Um, and so I, you know, even as a summer associate here at Dwayne Morris, um, kind of came into that experience with privacy on the brain and sought out the privacy partner who was like kind of the main person at the firm. Um, and I was like, I'm going to get an assignment with her. I don't care how I have to do it. I will figure it out. I went to her office. I introduced myself. She finally gave me an assignment. We got to work together. She has become a, a dear uh, mentor um, as well as, you know, someone that I do work for. Um, and so through that process, uh, was able to sort of hone that desire and, and, and keep doing it. Um, and doing other, you know, sort of general litigation stuff. Um, I also did not have clerkships on the front burner of the mind when I was in law school, um, mostly because I had started to set up this weird track that I was going to do and try to get an LLM on, at the end in, in some privacy related field and go abroad and blah, blah, blah. And then I realized that was a non-starter for a lot of practical reasons. Um, and so by that point, I had cut myself out of the loop to get a clerkship right out of school. Um, but during my summer associate class uh, here at Dwayne Morris, the, the firm has a, a basically a lunch every year where they take the summer associates down to the federal courthouse with the uh, four alums who are on the bench. And they give you, you know, a spiel where they say, look, if you want to do a clerkship after you start working, the firm loves it, we love it, and we've got this, you know, sort of understanding worked out, so you should apply. And I said, I'm going to do that. Um, and as it turns out, there is a, uh, the judge that I ended up clerking for, uh, Judge uh, Gerald McHugh, um, I have known since I was, you know, a wee lad, because I, I uh, knew his kids and we all went to the same school. Um, and so I started putting out resumes and trying to get a position. Um, and as it turns out, he had an opening in 2018. Um, and the stars all aligned and boom, there we were. So um, I was scheduled to do that. And he calls me and says, there is a person that he was trying to get um, from, I think, Georgetown, um, who literally had to clerk in 2018, because she was going to try to do government work uh, with the US Attorney's Office and had another clerkship already lined up. Would I mind switching places with her? No problem. Um, and so I ended up clerking in 2019, 2020 uh, for Judge McHugh. It was an amazing experience. It gave me, you know, as Diana said, the, the, you know, sort of back room. This is how it actually gets done. This is, you get to watch lawyers be good, watch lawyers be mediocre, watch lawyers be bad. You get to see good writing, bad writing, and everything in between, um, and just sort of understand how to pick apart a case and, and, and really kind of get what's going on. Um, you know, that was, you know, sort of incredibly uh, valuable. The firm was incredibly gracious and, and sort of smoothed the path going out. And because they knew it was in their best interest to do that in terms of getting me back, they smoothed the path coming back in. Um, and so I can, you know, speak a little bit about that process. Uh, and while I was clerking through a, a story that is too long to tell here, um, I actually essentially was handed a third circuit clerkship, which I will do uh, next or this 
coming September. Um, and so I will repeat this process of going out and coming back in. Um, and uh, so um, it, to wrap it up to Diana's point about being president in your career, the one thing I would also say is uh, finding time and the attention to be present in your life outside of the law. Um, because one thing I had to learn was there's a lot of life happening, even though this is like a 24, seems like a 24 seven job sometimes. And it remembering to smell the roses is something I think that's very important for all of us to do. I love that. And congratulations, Simi. And I didn't know about your third circuit gig. That's wildly impressive. Um, and also it sort of perfectly jumps into a question that we have from the audience. Um, I'm going to pull together a couple of questions and reword it um, to a point that I think some people seem to be struggling with. There is a sense out there, maybe even a fear, that moving back and forth the way that you guys have described somehow either derails or sets back your life within a firm. Meaning you take a step out of Dwayne, you go to clerk for a year, you come back. Are you on the same pay, pay scale now as your colleagues who graduated the same year? Do you feel like you've lost the firm experience, even if you've gained the clerkship experience? Do you feel like your relationships within the firm have suffered or, or not changed at all or gotten better? Um, can you sort of speak to a little bit more about the and address some of the fears that our audience members have about feeling like they might fall behind if they do that? Yeah, let me, um, I'm happy to do that. Um, so let me start by saying, uh, in general, if you are doing a federal clerkship, there is no loss to you whatsoever in terms of status, in terms of advancement, in terms of pay uh, of any kind. I mean, the only the, the only difference um, that there exists that I'm aware of with with many larger firms is that some firms will not, um, you may not get a clerkship bonus if you do, if you clerk for a magistrate judge, um, but anything at the district court and above, you not only receive a bonus, um, and then everything else, including the magistrate, uh, is, is true, what I'm about to say, um, but in terms of just doing the clerkship, you get credited for that year as if you had been at the firm. I mean, because firms realize how incredibly valuable your experience is, um, and they are more than happy to have that experience on their bench. Uh, so for the purposes of being competitive and the purposes of being, I mean, quite honestly, just fair about sort of the, the, the labor situation, um, they are more than willing to credit you for that year toward your advancement to partnership if that's what you seek. Uh, you are paid the same way. You don't lose pace in terms of, of, of pay or anything like that. And to the question about, um, you know, relationships and development, um, you know, look, I mean, it, it, I can use my, my experience as an example. I mean, you do have to be, you don't necessarily lose relationships as a matter of course. You lose them if you don't maintain them. And so what I tried to do when I was clerking is I was super intentional about rem remembering to connect with people on a monthly basis. So I was having lunch with a partner or, you know, someone in administration or whoever, or someone that I wanted to work with that I didn't have the, the ability to work with before. I was having lunch with one of those people every month and keeping my, you know, sort of face in their mind. Um, I actually also, and I don't, I mean, I don't know that this travels, but I actually also finagled a, an invitation to the Christmas party because like, I, I mean, I knew I was coming back and they knew I was coming back. And I was like, I mean, it's, you know, free food and stuff and it's the Christmas spirit. Why don't we all just get together? Um, and so that was part of my plan to just stay in touch and top of mind. Um, and, and then the other, the, the final piece I'll, I'll say uh, to uh, sort of allay fears is, a clerkship, I think, I mean, if you're thinking about a lateral move, a clerkship offers, it's the perfect segue, right? Because no, and particularly if you are, if you are going to a federal clerkship, because at that point, I don't know a firm that's going to look at you going to a federal clerkship and say, you know what, I don't really get that, right? Um, and, and by the way, I don't want you to bring all that stuff you just learned to our front door. So if you're thinking about that and you don't want to have to explain the move, it's kind of tailor-made for that purpose. Um, and, and it offers you a lot. It offers you a reset. It offers you a lot of knowledge um, all in one neat little package. 
And then Ashley, can I just add one additional point? Um, I think if, you know, it's clear that Dwayne Morris values Simeon as they should, but I think if you're at a place and then they're not offering sort of what Simeon has laid out and they're making this a difficult decision for you, I think that's something for you to also take in mind, you know, um, consider and that, you know, this, this clerkship would allow you then to go on to some place else that does value you. Cause I think oftentimes, you know, everyone's just so grateful to have a certain position at a big firm and they are very valuable, but I think at the same time we need, you know, everyone needs to be made, everyone needs to make sure that they are being valued the way that they should, you know, during this journey, during this, during your career. Cause if not, it's going to be a very, very long and even more stressful career. So I just wanted to emphasize, um, just point that out. And if, Ashley, do you mind if I jump in and add a Absolutely. few points? I will say, first of all, it's an excellent question. I actually had the exact opposite experience with respect to concerns or fears um, or any kind of uh, you know, backward, walking backwards as a result of going to the government on, on several different occasions. Um, the exact opposite happened to me. And that's because the firms where I was, they appreciate and, and, and re really very much appreciate the experience that I and folks like me were getting. We were able to get trial experience. We were able to get uh, litigation experience because litigation and trial work, not the same thing. They're not synonymous. People conflate them. Um, but I'm sure those of you out there in webinar land know that not the same thing. And the firms appreciate that. And so, as I think I mentioned earlier, when I came back to um, the firm where I had been a second year summer associate, and I actually turned down offers from two firms where I had been a first year summer associate and the one where I had been a second year summer associate, two different firms to go to the Department of Justice. And some of my friends did say, you know, what are you doing? They're going to be mad at you. They're never going to, you're never going to get back into private practice if and when you ever want to come. Do you want to be a career a public servant. Is that what you're going for? And I said, no, I'm, I'm going to try cases. I want to do a public service. I'm not committing my life to this. And I'm pretty sure I'll be able to come back. And in fact, I was able to come back and, and recruit it back. And that was because of two things. One, because of the experience, there's the value add. Because the reality is, as we all know, firms look for the value add. They look for, it's all, it's a business. Firms are businesses, they're legal businesses, but they're businesses nonetheless. The value add, if you're bringing critical skills particularly at a more junior level that some partners didn't have. When I came back from the Department of Justice, I had taken more depositions in two years, including expert depositions. Now, I'm not going to tell you some of those experts didn't totally annihilate me because they did, because I was a junior lawyer. But better to be annihilated when you're a junior lawyer than when you're a partner. But I had taken more depositions, including expert depositions, than some partners had. And I came back as a third-year associate. When I went to the U.S. Attorney's Office, after two years at the U.S., my first two years at the U.S. Attorney's Office, trying federal first chair, federal jury trials, I had tried more cases career-wise than half the partners in the litigation section of one of the largest firms in Philadelphia, so where, where I had been. And that's a huge, that's a huge thing. And so they were welcoming me back, welcoming me back with open arms and other folks were opening their arms as well. So I think you wanna think long-term very much so, um, but to echo what Diana said, you know, if you are at a place, and I don't think there's a great many of these places, but if you find yourself at a place that doesn't see that, doesn't see the value add, then you might wanna think about that because it's about what you're gonna do best for yourself. And then last, to, to really echo what, what Simeon said, see Simeon, he's obviously a super networker, all right, so you're hearing from a super networker. I'm gonna confess something to all of you out there. I am not, I am the opposite. I am negative Simeon. I'm opposite of Simeon. I am not a super networker. So where Simeon was having lunches every month and keeping contact, I was out trying cases and, and, and I just, my, my head was totally in the game. I was being completely present and probably somewhat absent. That doesn't mean, however, that when it comes down to when it really counts, that I haven't done what needs to be done to maintain relationships. The, the gigs that I've gotten, going into, getting into the US Attorney's Office, obviously I applied, but I 
knew someone from the Department of Justice who knew someone who was in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and so they could put in a word for you. You obviously always have to get in on your credentials, but that's the kind of relationship maintaining that I've done. So I want to tell you, for those of you who hear the N-word, that being networking, and you start getting hives, uh, for those of you who have heard, you know, be intentional about maintaining your relationships one too many times, and then you go the other direction, and you think you can never do that, that's me. I, I think that to, the, to this day, after 26 years, but somehow through maintaining organic relationships and just even one or two or three, I believe that there's only one to two degrees of separation between me and the person that might be at a place where I want to go, uh, whether it's in the government or otherwise. And that's what's most important. I love it. Um, even though I'm the moderator, I'm going to jump in as a panelist for a brief moment, having also moved from the DA's office to private practice and say, just to echo what April is saying, we have a lot of questions about how you sort of pull together what your skill set is when you're moving from a position like a DA's office into private practice. We have about two or three questions about that. Um, and I think April just really nicely explained all that she did and the ways that it gave her an edge in private practice. I want to add something to that, um, that I know we've both gained and I know Diana's gained as well from that trial level experience, which is confidence. Um, you work at a DA's office anywhere, you're getting your teeth kicked in all day, every day. And when you move into civil practice, it's important, I think, to, to demonstrate to somebody that you want to hire you, that there's virtually nothing that you can't handle. Um, to stand on your feet and have the weight of the world on your shoulders every Monday morning, arguing to 12 strangers who um, you know, are going to decide the fate of a person, whether they spend the rest of their lives in jail, it's heavy and it's serious and it demonstrates that you are an adult in the practice of law and that you can handle big things and survive it under significant pressure. Um, and it's a, a really cool skill set to take with you and to remember to take the confidence that you have in the courtroom into the conference room that you're sitting in or the Zoom meeting that you're sitting in when you're interviewing. I have a really interesting question that I think is probably bothers more than one person, even though it's only been asked by one person. The question is for all panelists, do I have to start all over by applying to entry level positions when I'm leaving public service? Can I use my JD and experience to get higher up roles if I'm moving into government or nonprofit positions? How do you suggest I handle that? And that's an interesting question. I think it suggests that there's this feeling as though your three to seven years of experience wherever you are might not translate. Are you starting from the, the ground up? Um, I'm interested to hear the panelists thoughts on that question. Well, I can start off. I know from my experience going from, um, I think I was a, an eighth, seventh or eighth year associate and then I moved to the DA's office. Um, and so I had, you know, the litigation experience that, you know, April had mentioned litigation does not mean trial experience, especially at a big firm. So I had the litigation experience, but not the trial experience. And so I did literally have to start from zero into knowing what it was, what is the criminal justice center here in Philadelphia and just knowing that. So I think it, it's a little bit of both. And I think wherever you are, whenever you go somewhere new, you are going to have to start all over in the sense of it's a completely new organization. It's you need to know the lay of the land wherever you are. Um, so you do have to start over in that front. I think depending on what government or public interest or nonprofit or whatever position you're going into to the extent that there are a lot of those transferable skills, I think that April was mentioning, um, I think you can try to negotiate something higher than that initial entry level. But I think everyone should keep in mind that wherever you're going new, there is a learning curve. It's not, it's not going to be automatic just because you tried or you, you know, you drafted all these successful 12 v 6 motions in federal court. It doesn't mean anything in the court of common pleas or the criminal justice center. You need to always you unfortunately do have to reprove yourself each time as to your 
your worth. But at the same time, it's, you, I think you got to just balance that with m- knowing your value and knowing that you are going to succeed in this new environment and that you bring a lot to the table. So I think in true lawyer fashion, I try to address, do say that it's sort of a little bit of, um, of both of those things. Uh, if if I may add on to that, I agree with Diana. When uh, when you're going from a firm, we'll try both ways. When you're going from a private practice uh, from a firm uh, where you're doing civil litigation and you go into uh, the government, um, but particularly in a trial role, and particularly, frankly, whether whether we're civil or criminal, um, not only is there a learning curve, but frankly, you should expect to be at the low end of the totem pole. Not, I mean, subject matter wise, but that's just how it is. I mean, I'm, I know Ashley did bail hearings. I did bail hearings. I had been a lawyer for quite a few years, uh, had done many other things in civil litigation, um, but I was still doing bail hearings. I worked on Christmas. I worked on two Thanksgivings in a row. You know, there were things that, that had to be due. You were, I was putting in my dues because I didn't have that subject matter experience. Like Diana said, there's a learning curve. Um, but as if you're a quick learner, you're gonna be a quick learner whether you're in the government whether you're in private practice, whether you're in solo practice, whether you're in a corporation, whether you're in public interest. Um, and that's what's gonna take you forward. So let's go on the back end, coming from the government, whatever it is, it could be an agency, because there's always there's lots of agency counsel, not just these prosecutor or defense lawyer jobs. So you're coming from a government position and going either back into a firm, maybe where you were before, like Simeon said, or back to a firm in general for private practice, how are you treated then? And I think whoever asked that question was, it's a really good question because I've actually seen it happen both ways. Um, I have seen firms, some individuals in firms who have had no experience other than going straight from law school into a summer associate, into a law firm and have spent their entire careers there. Some folks do have a more myopic perspective and there's not, there's not, that's not good or bad, but when you've had that experience and you haven't stepped outside of it, you, you tend to have tunnel vision. And sometimes that could um, manifest in folks saying, you know, all right, you've been at the government for five years, but why should we bring you in as a sixth year associate? Why wouldn't we bring you in as a, as, as a second year associate? Because I'm sure that what we're doing here at the firm is so much more complex than the drug conspiracy cases that you were prosecuting. And I've seen that. I mean, I've seen that atmosphere. I've also seen it the, the opposite way, the way that I experienced it. With respect to that more, more narrow perspective, what I've seen be successful for the people who've been addressing, who uh, dealt with that was, look, okay, it's true. I haven't been here for six years, so I don't know the firm policies. I don't know the ins and outs and the, the different things that are very specific to this the, the firm culture. But what I do have is six years of taking 60 depositions or doing these cases or doing evidentiary hearings. Not everything has to be a trial. I I love trial, but not everything has to be a trial. So here's what I do have. It's focused on what you have. And trust me, if you've been in a government service position as an attorney um, or as an advisor or counselor for a number of years, you have skills and experiences that folks who have only been in a large law firm don't have. And that's what you focus on. And I've seen that be successful. Ashley, I'll, uh, I'll I'll jump in on that too, um, just very briefly. I mean, I think all of that is right, right? Like, uh, I think fundamentally transferability and the value that it provides is going to depend on kind of what you were doing on either side. Uh, so it's a number of factors, right? It's not just like there's there's not a one size fits all answer, um, but certainly, I mean, to April's point, you know, if especially coming back into a firm, right? If you had significant trial experience. Um, and, and I think all of that counsels in, you know, whatever it was you were doing, but particularly if it's that it counsels in favor of, of, of selling yourself appropriately and highlighting the, the value that you're bringing from that experience. Um, and I think most firms that are, that understand the value of having that on their bench, will look at that and say, yes, that's an incredibly trained. I mean, if you've taken a deposition, you've taken a deposition. If you've first chaired a case you first chaired a case and the subject matter may differ um, and there are, you know, slightly different rules and all of that, you know, nuance, but an an experienced skilled practitioner is going to have the ability to, to April's point, uh, you know, make that switch because, you know, the, the, the underlying experience is there. So I think it really does, um, 
you know, it does counsel in favor of if, wh whichever way you're going to make the move, but particularly if you're coming back into a, a private firm from government service, being able to sell everything about your service in, to the government that makes it of value to the firm. Um, and I've seen it work out where it's you come in and you're going to take a haircut in terms of advancement by a year or two. I've seen it come out where it's it's, you know, pretty much, you know, even money. Um, and it really, I think, kind of depends on what that person was doing and how they made the pitch. But if you make it, I think some firms will play ball and they'll say, look, you know, come right on in and don't lose a step. So we have a question um, about moving into going from government work into the private sector. What was the first step that you took to do that? Well, I'll, I'll take the first shot at this. Uh, well, I did it twice. So the first time uh, was really a Simeon story because like Simeon's story, I merely went back to the law firm where I'd been a second year summer associate. My mentor was a senior partner there uh, and uh, worked with him. I think he always had an eye toward me coming back, which I, I frankly did as well. And uh, after you know the time period being at the Department of Justice and thinking about going back, coming back home, I, I, I placed a call and my prior work stood for itself. My prior work, plus the fact that I had gained all of those, all that experience where um, when I went back to the firm, they were able to put me on litigation where they could get me to cover expert depositions as a third year associate. Um, so that might, that's a more unique situation. The second time, however, when I had spent years at the U.S. Attorney's Office as a federal prosecutor and decided just for life change reasons, personal life change reasons, to go back into private practice, I did have an offer from that same firm. So there, that, that relationship persisted uh, and maintained over the years. Um, I did not wind up going to that firm, however. Um, so what was my first step other than speaking to my mentor? It was calling up some of my friends who were at different firms and saying, hey, I think, uh, you know, I've been talking about this for a while. Now's the time I'm going to be leaving. I'm not sure uh, where I'm going, you know, what I'm looking to do uh, in terms of firms. What, what do you have to say? What, let's talk about your firm. Uh, and through that process, people started calling me and, and asking me to come in and I, and I did and I wound up going to um, a, a large Philadelphia law firm, but not one for which I had been a summer associate. So for those of you who are saying, oh, well, gee, that's, you know, that's easy. You had all these friends, they were in law firms, because trust me, that's what I'd be saying, right? If I were on the other end of this screen, that's exactly what I would say. Remember, I told you I'm not a super networker. So I didn't have 1 billion people to call. I, that's just not me. Simeon has a billion plus one. I, you know, I'm on the other side, but I did have, you don't have to have a billion. You need a few because those people have friends as well, all right? And your work speaks for itself. You've got your, you do make sure you do a great job of whatever government service job you're at. You've got that reference oral or written in the pocket and you start calling a few of your friends if they're in places where you think you might wanna go or to kind of frankly brainstorm with them about what might be your next move and how to most, you know, smooth the way in. It is easier when you know someone and they don't have to be in a position of authority, they just have to be in the mix. And again, I tell you, I believe that we're all two degrees of separation from the person who needs that we wanna to speak to to get us into the place where we wanna be. Ashley, if I could uh, follow up on what April said, um, uh, I, have, I have just shy of a billion people to call, not, not, quite, not quite a full billion. Um, but to April's point earlier about how it's like having an, you know, like whatever your crucial relationships are and being able to maintain, even if it's just a few of them. I mean, despite having, you know, just shy of a billion people that I can call the, the magic sort of uh, uh, sauce from that perspective over the course of my, you know, now developing career has really been one person. And one person who has stuck by me since I was in high school and followed me through that whole trajectory of, you know, hiding out and not doing it, not doing it. Not, and that person never lost faith. Um, and that person is now a, 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 you know, senior partner at a major uh, firm here in Philadelphia um, and has been my immediate phone call, email, text message to then get to the, now he knows 
2 billion people. Um, and so I've been able to tap that network repeatedly in terms of the different moves that I was going to make. Um, and, and so like, so there's that, right? It doesn't have, you don't have to know a billion people and you don't have to use all of them to, to get where you're going. I think the other thing I wanted to pick up on what April said is having, you know, sort of making those phone calls initially to your friends. It had, there, there's another practical purpose, I think, to that, which is most firms, certainly ours does, but I think most of the large law firms do, um, offer their associates and perhaps even partners, but I'm not sure, um, an incentive to recruit people to the firm, right? And so to the extent that you are able to, I mean, yes, you can call a recruiter and, then, and that's a whole you know, other process and that's a whole separate question, but you can also call your friends who happen to be at these firms uh, that you may be looking to go to and they have the ability, you know, I mean, if, if they refer you and you decide this is the move I want to make, or at least I want to put my hat to the, to the ring uh, for a position at this firm, that it benefits your friend, it benefits you, you now have an in and your friend has an incentive to, to help bring you into the firm. So those phone calls not only help you get to get information, gather intelligence about the market, but it could also be the, literally the way you get into that law firm through that person. And I would just echo what April and Simeon said. My path was through initially networking. Um, I met the hiring partner at a, of the first firm I was at, at a um, networking event for the Philadelphia Diversity Law Group. So I think that along with the any type of associations, networking groups, um, I would encourage you all, if you don't have the billion or the two billion people that Simeon and his crew have, um, I would encourage you all to, you know, reach out to us. You can reach out to us directly. Sorry, I put that out there for the rest of the panelists too, but to the Villanova Law uh, Alumni Association as well and the, you know, the different um, folks of color listening. There's the Minority Association as well. So there's already a lot of things built in that you can just easily contact. And then as April had said, there's the two degrees of separation that is literally right there at your fingertips. So I would strongly encourage you to do that if you're you don't have the billions of people. And Ashley, I know you probably have another question, but just to, act, to, to tack on to that, um, I am a, a very proud member of the VLAA with Ashley. I'm the immediate past president, and I'm also the uh, current president of the Villanova Law Inn of Court. I tell you all that because my friends, the friends that I was referring to, I've, I've some of those friends, some of those good friends I've cultivated through my leadership positions and or membership in those associations. Uh, and I really mean that. Now, I, you know, I, you, you hear about joining the bar or doing this or doing that. There's so many things that are competing for our time. But I'm letting you know that those relationships have paid dividends, not just for pro professionally, which is what we're kind of here talking about today, but, but personally. Uh, but on the professional note, uh, the person who uh, I spoke to, who, uh, to whom's first firm I eventually went, was a former president of the VLAA. And so when I was looking to leave the US Attorney's Office and he was a former prosecutor in EDPA, uh, I knew him, but not that well, but I knew him only through our association with VLAA. And that actually landed me my first you know, big firm spot after I left the US Attorney's Office. So that's, that's a success story right there. I strongly recommend it, not just to plug it um, because it's great and you'll enjoy it. I'm going to add add to that because it is really the purpose behind today's meeting and getting together is to remind everyone that there is a strong network of people. You've got four of them right here on screen. Um, and I hope that everybody who's joining us today feels a little bit more comfortable to reach out to the Alumni Association, to reach out to the people who are on this call because we are here to help. And in particular, in a time like this, where you're constantly hearing that there's a hot market and that there's a lot of lateral movement you can sort of step back and wonder what well, doesn't, it, or, or maybe feel if that it doesn't apply to you. Um, it does, and you might just need to talk through it someone with someone. Every move that I've made in my career, there was someone from the Alumni Association who was a friend in Confidant, and it was never the same person twice. So um, I think knowing that there is a diverse group of attorneys in that network as, as that are available to you is the most important takeaway for today. We're actually just about out of time and we have way too many questions left out there to ask them all. So um, I think I'll end with a thank you to our panelists 
for sharing their stories, for sharing some of their vulnerabilities too, and for making, I think, everybody who joined the call today a little bit stronger in, in their lateral move um, experience and search right now. So thanks to all of the panelists and to everyone who joined us. Uh, we have one more coming, to, I'm sorry, two more coming next week. And um, Kim Madden will be sticking a, a link in there for everyone. Um, the topics that are coming up next are moving in-house or from in-house out of house, and then also moving from a law practice to a law related job, which I think is wildly interesting. And we have a bunch of really cool panelists for that one as well. So I sincerely hope you all can join us. Thanks so much for coming today.